Okay, so yes, indeed, it's uh, not really a technical talk. Um, I want you to uh, take a walk with me with uh, a corgi. You know, this beautiful dog, isn't it? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, hello, I'm Thomas, and I'm an addict. Yep. <laughs> Um, my drug of choice is solving logical problems. And writing software is a simple, powerful, never-ending way to deliver that to me. It's an hypnotic drug. In 2012, and I went into a frenzy of it. Writing software became my only reality at some times. From working day after day, I started working nights, and then weekends. Sleeping was getting rare and difficult. My body started to complain. I got fat, and fat, and fat. My back was painful, and ended up failing me. My mood was constantly bad. I was on edge all day long. I was tired, miserable, and people will keep their distances from me. There's some people in the room that have seen me at that time. And friends and family convinced me to change and to stop that. And I did. I was relieved. But still, the crash came. And they say that for those who have been through a burnout, things are never the same. It's true. I'm not as passionate as I was, but I'm glad of that. In such a bad shape and bad state, I had to decide what to do. Either continue to stumble into the dark pit or change. But where to start? What to do? Well, I decided to do what seemed to be the easiest thing to do and the most urgent getting some rest, and moving a bit more. Or rather, I did not decide much. I felt the need for the change, and I did what seemed doable at the time, getting some sleep and moving. I took a vacation. I jumped in my car and went to some family place, and I slept. And the next morning, I started running. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> As software developer, we don't run much. I didn't run much that day either. <laughs> About 100 meters in two times. <laughs> yep, that hard. And for the next two weeks, I spent my time sleeping, eating nice food, swimming, walking and relaxing. It was difficult, but on vacation, it's a very good time to change your schedule. So, I did that. And then I went back to work as a self-employed Ruby developer, and I took breaks whenever I felt the need for them. And I kept the same schedule going for some time. Running, walking, working, having breaks. And I felt that I would be able to go on like this. So I kept going. And I also read about the paleo diet. Some, maybe some of you are aware of it. It's basically using what the people from the Paleolithic were supposed to eat. I don't think that the science behind it is entirely sound, but as a full lover and cook, I like the idea to go back to some basics in kitchen. So I dropped bread, pasta, rice, and went back to some basics. And bits by bits, things were getting better. 
And somehow, thing, the things I was doing were working. My mood was getting better. My work, too. And my body started to get stronger, better. It seemed logical. Moving a bit more, eating nicer food, what can go wrong from that? Happy to see improvements, I started to reflect on what went wrong to avoid going there again. So, I looked around and I had some ideas about the, who could be the culprit. So I asked a psychologist and a former HR person about my experience. They all pointed out to myself and the culture I was evolving in. I'm quite lucky to do what I'm doing. I not only love it, I need it and I crave for it. As I told you, writing code is my drug. So I ask myself, what if patient is turning into poison for me? Patient is one of the best things we can have. It's what differentiates people who simply write code and people who make software, develop software. Patient drives us to get better. It's what drives us through hours of work, reading and writing. Patient drives me. It drives me blind. Once I start, my mind quickly turns into the zone. And I forget whatever is around me. And if you are able to stop at that point, from time to time, and get back to real world, it's okay. But otherwise, it's just madness. You end up staying there. And then my passion consumed me. I grew intensely addicted to it. To solving bugs, making new features. And I could not stop. So I started to understand afterwards that my passion was a double-edged sword. In a way, it's pushing me forward to get better and to make better software and better work. But at the same time, it's pulling me into a sweet blur where I don't want to leave, to go out of. But I didn't want to see patient as a total poison because that will mean to quit all the developing world, to stop what I like to do. So, how could I do that? I read more and checked a bit more in myself and my story. And I started to see that patient was not the only culprit. That there was something more at work. Patient drew me in. But cultures kept my head under the water. Cultures are an important thing in my mess. Cultures from my family, cultures from the companies and the industry I've worked in, and culture of my country. See, my dad was a work addict. He was an IT professional from the 70s to early 2000s. He started work with computers when they were eating cardboard and cheating paper. And when, <laughs> and, um, when he retired, the iPad just got announced. So you can see what he saw. And he worked a lot. My brother, mother, and I, we didn't see much of him when my brother and I were young. He provided, provided us with everything, including the idea that work is a very important thing in our life. And in most countries and companies, there is this idea that work that you have to, is very important and that you have to be at work, or to work a lot. In France, to most of you it's probably no surprise, but in France, you're seen as, as a slacker if you leave earlier than 6 p.m., regardless of the time you arrive at the office in the morning. In Japan, you are seen as a traitor to the company if you leave too early. And in Japan still, it's, 
falling asleep from exhaustion at work is seen like a sign of commitment to the company. And the startup culture, spending just a few hours sleeping every day, is seen as a warrior badge that we wear proudly. Whoa. All those, to each to some degree, influenced me. And I understand that these points, all together, on top of patient, locked me into a vicious circle. Feeling a responsibility toward my work, company, co-workers, family, and on a binding, I could not stop or I had a perfect reason not to. By then, a bigger picture started to emerge. My body was not just a pile of rubble in the middle of a dessert. Dessert? Not the sweet things. The runes had a story attached to them, fueled by passion and culturally, cultural induced stress. I kept going regardless of how tired or how fed up I was. So, by now, I started to understand what not to do, what to avoid in my way to work. I also started to grow interested in why my body failed and how I could continue to bring it back to a healthy status. I remember what one of my doctors told me when my back was locked and I was in bed for two weeks. And my weight was about 95, 98 kilograms. For my eight is quite dangerous point. And from his point of view, my problem was my hyper sedentary lifestyle, meaning sitting in front of a computer for 10 hours a day. He told me, your body is not designed for that. It's been designed around walking, not sitting. So, what if science had some things to explain to me? Yes, science. As Walter Bishop experimented so much, I didn't look into so much genetics, but something that involved genetics, meaning evolution, from the Darwinist point of view. And old evolution happened, and all it influenced the body of our ancestors and ours as a consequence. Well, it turns out that up to very recently, our ancestors spent much of their day walking and running. Well, you see, it was a very needed fact because, well, if you didn't walk or run, you were not able to find food or to escape from a predator. So, well, it was a necessity. And you also needed to walk to find a new place to leave or a new place to put the camp. Yep, there is no sitting in there, just walking and running. Strange. And I looked also how the brain works. Turns out, physical activity helps a lot how the brain works and its cognitive capacities by releasing or helping to release a lot of chemicals into the bloodstream. And without those, you get depressed, hungry, unstable. Ooh, surprise. Sleep also is not, not only let the body rest, but it allows the brain to rearrange the data that it has seen. Studies have shown that for rats, for example, put, you put rats in labyrinths and you let them go around the labyrinth to find the food at the other end. And then the next day, you try again. Surprise, they are faster. Not because of a smell, but because, and it's been shown with MRIs and other brain imagery techniques, that the brain replays again and again and again the scenario during the sleep of the rat to improve connection in the brain. So, ooh, sleep is important. It helps improving connective faculties. Naps, you know, sleeping a few minutes in the afternoon, have also been found as very helpful. NASA 
you know, the space agencies that send robots to Mars. I've seen, I've shown that of 26 minute slips improve a lot the capacities of the pilots. Stress, stress is something natural, but it's only good in spikes, like very precise, limited time, because it was how it happened back in the time when a predator was coming or when you needed to solve a problem quickly to cross a river, for example. And chronic stress, meaning all the time, is pretty bad for the brain and the body because it will release continuously chemicals in the bloodstream. Those chemicals will push the earth, the earth to some limits and scars it and damage it permanently. Yep. In the end, science says, no 10 hours of, 10 hours of work there. No on-lighters, no continual stress. So, for me, it was clear that I had ignored the nature of my body and brain. And just like a machine badly maintained start to rust and fall apart, my body started to send some alarm signals, run on emergency protocols, and then crashed. No surprise that, that I had seen improvements once I started to move, rest, and eat properly. So, where to? I assure you, no cats or dogs have been hurt for this conference. <laughs> Comforted in these changes, I decided to push on and articulate a new schedule upon my findings. I could hope to find a balance between my patient and the rest of my life, in order for the patient to stay in sa inside safe boundaries, and my body healthy, my brain functional. So I needed to fit in proper sleep, proper physical activity, proper food, proper relax time, and proper work time, of course. <laughs> Somehow along the past months, still, I realized that I had managed to get all this in. I just had to find uh, something that works a bit better. But just like Mr. Jourdain, I was doing pros already. So I kept running. And by then, I was able to do two or three kilometers per week. But seeing it was getting easier, I pushed myself, and I'm now ab able to do five kilometers twice a week. It's still hard. but. I'm not tired after each of those runs. It fuels my whole week, and I feel energized to do those. After all the readings I did to understand what happened to me and how I could improve or fix myself, reading started to be a big part of my days, everyday life. And no, it's a daily routine. Hacker news, medium, and lots of articles grabbed here and there about programming language, closure, Ruby, whatever. Uh, economics, politics, science, what, anything and everything. It takes me hours, but it gives me a lot of inspiration, ideas, and solutions to my problems and problems I see in work. I also started to write. When I did some traveling some years ago, and one of the authors I read um, from back then was saying, well, how could I know what I think if I don't write it? Writing your ideas down helps you rearrange them, and you start to, uh, they start to be clearer. So it's a necessary process. And writing them, short blogs, blog posts, short articles, or just few lines. Publishing them or not, not important, but writing them helped me to get my thoughts clearer and find inspiration and new solutions for my work. Having read and written, my thoughts were clearer, as I said. And still, sometimes, I will 
find myself locked upon a problem. I will keep working on it for too much time. You know that feeling. You can't find the solution of a bug. And you think, it must be right in front of my nose. And tired, you go out, walk, or you go have a coffee. And right when you are pouring the coffee, the idea occurs. The solution is right in front of you. And for me, it was taking walks or just having a um, break two minutes away from the computer that will provide me the solution. So I thought, well, better take some breaks, walks a bit more. I live in Toulouse. It's a beautiful city, nice place to walk by the Garonne River. So, and quite a lot of time during my walk. So when I was coming back, I will have the solution to my problem. So instead of staying angrily in front of my computer, banging on my keyboard to find the solution and make the test pass, now I just go and walk and come back. It's a Eureka thing, you know. You relax and then, oh, Eureka. Similarly, rubber duck debugging or rubber panda debugging helps to set the brain in different mode, and that's actually what works. Doing all those things helps to keep the brain and the body in a sane and proper state. But as you might say, as you might think already, it reduces the amount of hours I can spend working. But it's okay. Because you just have to make it count. You just have to change your way of working. Well, I did. I changed my way of working to make those hour counts. I started to use the Pomodoro, Pomodoro technique because it will give me a frame, a nice set of minutes to work, then relax, then work and relax. If you're not familiar with Pomodoro technique, go check on Google, you'll find it in quite fast. And so I need to prepare a bit my days, but uh, but I take a set of ideas and problems, I slice them down to very little item, items in order to have one item per Pomodoro session or two items per Pomodoro session. Then I set in front of me all those sessions and I go for them for half a day. Those are often the basics, the basis for my topic branches in Git. Also learn to accept that I'm pretty bad at some things. I'm not a designer. I don't like paperwork. But I know that some people love to do that stuff. Yes, even paperwork. I can't believe this. But. Um, so I pass the ball to them. I call them. I try to find someone to do it. And if I can't, because I don't have the money to contract them, that I try to spend the proper amount of time to learn or to do that thing or to get help. It's okay to be bad at something. Then automation. Because you have a bit less hours of work, you need to automate all what can be. And I automated deployment, test, and quality check of my code. I use Heroku or some Chef Salt um, on, on, on made infrastructure. I use Semaphore to run my test continuously. I use Code Climate to check the quality of the code. Code Climate won't tell me for 100% sure that my code is good, but it will raise a red flag if the quality drops too badly. So from a crash and a ton of questions about why and how it happened, I managed to get out of the dark pit by changing slowly my way to live. I say live, not work. I started by doing things that felt natural and easy to do at, the t at each time. And curious, looking for answers, I read and researched a bit. I then understood why the small change I made, I made such a difference and where working. Why walking, running, talking, 
taking breaks, eating proper food, and having proper sleep worked. Because my body and my brain needed those. As simple as that. I ended up with a leaner way to work. And instead of spending 10 hours a day working, free, working without a plan, adding bugs instead of features in a rush, eating junk food, I can now plan ahead my work and then pull a walk through a set of planned features and steps for a few hours every day. In the three hours, I then take care of my body, my family, my friends, and my food. More importantly, I see that these changes help me to find a balance in life, to find a better mix. And after all, this is what it's all about. This is not a recipe. This is, these are not rules. This is just a story about how I decided to change a bit my way of living and working and doing things and the reasons behind those changes and what I found along the way. And if you can avoid one person to go those, through those bad times, then, well, it'd be worth it. So, what you can take with you, I think, is check your body, check your life. Are they healthy? Do you think you can go long like this? Yes? No? Check. Check the science, more importantly. Check all other people do, and if the science and all those other methods work, will make sense to you. Will it benefit you? Thank you. I'm Thomas Ribouillet. I'm a developer and writer. I'm currently looking for a permanent job outside of France. You can contact me on Twitter and GitHub or by email. I want to thank the Rulu team for this event. And the choice to let the non-technical talk finish the event. I want to thank Fabien, the Arbuzi Gang, and Katrina Owen for helping me preparing this talk. And I want to thank you, the Ruby community members, for being what you are, a friendly group of people who are just looking for better ways to do things. Thank you very much.